Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the GEB America podcast. I'm David Groves. My host, Stephen Gunn, is with me. Stephen is here to introduce our guest and uh, kick off what we're calling this show, which is Making Your Money Work for You in 2024. We have a very special guest. Uh, I have the pleasure of interviewing him uh, in our studio for our show we had many years ago, uh, Mr. Jerry Robinson. Jerry, welcome back to the show with us here. And Jerry is from followthemoney.com. Joining us today, he's an economist, veteran trend trader, best-selling author, and has a passion for researching and teaching the Bible. He graciously shares his lectures on- online as well at truerichesradio.com. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Looking forward to it. Yes, sir. Well, let's just jump right in. How similar is our financial health and its level of importance, would you say? And then also maybe what are some ways that we can get back in shape with the personal finances? Yeah, personal finance is a very big, big topic. And of course, is the older you get, the more important it seems to get. When you're younger, those of you who are listening in the audience today, you have the Adonis complex, maybe your sub, uh, you know, well, I don't want to say a number, but you know what I mean? When, when you're when you're younger, uh, you feel like time is on your side and you're right. Unfortunately, if you don't take advantage of that time being on your side, it really doesn't matter uh, when it comes to finances. And this is a really important thing for those out there who are thinking about their finances as we head into this new year. Because we live in a comfortable society, there is the idea that somehow um, we can rely upon the federal government to take care of us if we fail to save. Well, in many ways, it is true that you can rely upon friends and family and the federal government. Taking care of our finances is extremely important. It's also important to our Christian witness, Uh, how how it really wouldn't be a, a great witness um, if if we spend our lives really not taking uh, thought of any kind of preparation, not seeing evil afar off and taking preparation, and instead had to rely upon people who were you know maybe even unsaved. I want to. I'm gonna put out a few terms to you, and if you could just maybe kind of define for our listeners, they've heard these, but they don't know what it means And as an educational. The first one is this idea of something called DCA. What does it mean to DCA? To DCA means to regularly and consistently invest into assets. Uh, you can DCA into many different assets, and I actually have a, my own personal DCA strategy. I think everyone should. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Every Monday, my wife and I, we will DCA or dollar cost average some money into particular asset. And so every Monday, that's our DCA day and it's every single week. So if it's Monday, we're investing. So it's a part of our life. It's a part of the thing that we do. So dollar cost averaging is probably one of the very best ways for people to invest. It allows them to buy. uh, If you're buying stocks, for example, it allows you to buy more shares when they're cheap. And it allows you to buy less shares when they're expensive, which is exactly the way to do it. The habit mm-hmm. of investing through, especially through dollar cost averaging, is something that you never want to uh, you never want to stop once you start it. Yeah. So the ETFs are very popular. I really like ETFs for trading purposes and also for longer term investing, especially the index funds. An ETF is an exchange traded fund. It's simply um, it's very similar to a mutual fund, except that it trades like a stock. And it's typically much lower fees, not always, but typically much lower fees. And quite frankly, one of the uh, biggest ETFs, in fact, I think it is the biggest ETF, uh, the S&P 500 ETF, SPY. The ETF is a powerful vehicle for investing and trading, and it's typically lower expense. Jerry, talk to us a little bit just from an educational level. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a currency without a government. It's a form of self-authenticating value exchange. It is one of the most novel technologies that has ever been created. I was so fortunate to learn about Bitcoin in 2012. I had a friend who was a 
one of the very earliest adopters. In fact, he may have been one of the very early adopters of all uh, by the name of Trace Mayer. Uh, I was fortunate. I was running a, a podcast. I still run the, my uh, Follow the Money podcast. It was back in 2012, and uh, I was interviewing him about something else. He came on and he said, uh, have you ever heard of this thing called Bitcoin? This is 2012. I said, no, I never heard. He said, you really ought to buy some. Um, and at the time, it was trading for you know less than 25 bucks or whatever. Oh. Uh, it, it, it went on, of course, to, to do very well. Yes. And so we, we've been talking about Bitcoin on our po podcast you know, since 2012 and sharing this with our folks. Many of our folks have become wildly wealthy just from investing in a few of those. In fact, back then, we used to say, hey, just buy one or two Bitcoin or even buy 10. You know, it, was, it was less than 1000 bucks to buy 10 of them at the time. Right. Uh, Bitcoin has transformed finance because... It removes the need for an intermediary. Um, this okay. has infuriated banks. This has infuriated uh, the traditional status quo, uh, the traditional finance. And so they're trying to figure out what to do with it. There's been a big battle brewing in Washington about Bitcoin, of course, the SEC and all of this. But Bitcoin ultimately is a currency without a government. It is a, it is a form of, of self-authenticating value exchange. You need no one to clear it. You need no one to confirm it. Uh, as far as a, a third party, it's just so in other words, let me I'll, I'll put it to you this way. If I wanted to send $10 million to someone in London right now, I have uh, several ways to do it, but uh, they're all very expensive. Uh, traditionally, the quite frankly, if I went down to the bank and said, I need to wire $10 million to London, it would be cheaper for me to buy a plane ticket. And to, <laughs> right. and to take take the take the briefcase and fly it over there and go over there and get a hotel and stay there for a day and, and, and hand off the briefcase and come back, it would be cheaper than actually paying the bank the fee. But with Bitcoin, I can make that move for pennies. I can send $10 million around the world for pennies. So what this has done is that as people become familiar with what Bitcoin is, they're able to transfer money without the third expensive third parties and without of course the ma the massive expense that's typically uh, associated with that so it's a real step forward in finance it's a real step backward for uh the government because it exposes them and their bloated systems that now are b coming under fire because there's a better way so i think it's improving finance i think it's a we're living in a really interesting time with bitcoin today and we're all learning about it. Yeah, definitely want to um, want to have you back to talk more specifically on cryptocurrency and what is it, and because I know there's sure. different there's different ones. I mean, there's thousands, but there's also uh, different protocols uh, as we know, proof of work versus proof of stake, and and all these things that I'm sure our listeners are like, what are you saying? But uh, it, along those lines, it, can you real briefly tell us from an educational standpoint, what is the, then a blockchain? Because I know and we're getting ready to have some innovative people on in the next few weeks talk about blockchain technology and how it's being used. But wh what is a blockchain with regard to finance? Well, it's it's really just simply a ledger. It's a, um, it's, it's a, it's a ledger. It's a form of, of um, keeping track, just like you would use a ledger for. It's triple in entry bookkeeping. Um, it's uh, that's a really good question to try to explain what a blockchain is because you you think about what blockchains really are they're really just a permanent record of all the different transactions that have occurred and therefore those can be open and permissionless or they can be permissioned they can be closed so blockchains are very uh useful in that respect uh, and we are already seeing quite frankly which i think is very interesting is that the federal reserve here is already talking about a digital dollar they haven't released it yet but they've been testing right. it Ch china's already released its own digital Correct. yuan mm -hmm. and so when you look at that you think to yourself that's really interesting because the white paper on bitcoin came out halloween uh, uh, october 31st i think it was 2008 that's an interesting day Bitcoin in many ways, and this may be strange for your audience, but I think they would really appreciate this, is the white paper on Bitcoin was put out October 31st, 2008, and it contained grievances against the current system. And it, it offered decentralization. It said, basically, everything is too centralized. We're, we're providing something decentralized. This this was put out, this white paper this that stunned the world was put out on October 31st, 2008. What's interesting is if you go back to October 31st, 1517, 
That was the same day that Martin Luther was mm -hmm. nailing uh, his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church talking. And, and ultimately what this was, was a decentralization. So just as Protestantism is a decentralization of the church from the centralized power of Catholicism, right? So Protestantism comes out of Catholicism. It's not something new. It's it comes out of Martin Luther was a Catholic. I mean, in other words, so what, what they're doing is they're coming out of it and they are decentralizing it. Uh, they want decentralized. They don't like the centralized powers. Well, this is what Bitcoin is doing. It's saying this helps people who are listening understand this very quickly. That Bitcoin is saying we don't like the centralized financial system. We want a decentralized financial system. And so Bitcoin is born. But it's interesting the date that it was released. It's a it's kind of a throwback to uh, another decentralization moment uh, with uh, you know with the with the uh, Protestant Church and also quite frankly the United States was an attempt at decentralization in some way, right. uh, decentralizing from the European powers.